Hi, everyone. Good morning from Hiroshima. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Dalia Simawan, Assistant Professor at Hiroshima University and one of the core members of NERPS or the Network for Education and Research on Peace and Sustainability. And I will be your moderator for this webinar. This NERPS webinar series started last year and it features leading experts on topics related to the relationship between peace and sustainability in the context of global transformations. The title of today's webinar is Protected Area Management and Natural Resource Governance, Exploring Pathways for Environmental Peace Building. We have invited two leading researchers from Columbia University, and we're very glad that they accepted our invitation to talk to us about this topic. And I will introduce them right before they um, speak later. First, I'd like to request Professor Shinji Kaneko, our NERPS director, to give his welcome remarks. Thank you, Daria, and good morning, everybody in Japan and Asia, and good evening in New York, and then hello to the rest of the world. Um, I'm very glad that we could have like four NERPS webinar, where each time we have been expanding our scope of discussions and building on the in-depth uh, analysis and argument on peace and sustainability. Uh, so this time, uh, I'm also very glad to invite the very special team of the researchers at the Columbia University, and led by uh, Professor Joshua Fisher, who is director of SG4, and also became um, close appointed professor of Hiroshima University as uh, one of the new research clusters on peace and sustainability. So AC square, AC4, sorry, AC4 is one of the, I think, uh, a few leading uh, uh, research uh, group and organization that is moving ahead of our NAPS initiative. And, and so this is a very important and um, precious opportunity for the member of HU to explore new collaborative relationship with this uh, on the topic of peace and sustainability. So I'm looking uh, very much forward to have a fruitful discussions and new collaborative opportunity. And at the end, while we are continuing this NAPS webinar toward the, uh, the first face-to-face uh, -face international conference in Hiroshima uh, in coming October, we are planning to ho hold those uh, event. Uh, so I'm hoping that we expand this uh, network and community where eventually try to have some opportunity to, to meet uh, together in Hiroshima in this coming October. So thank you very much. Thank you, Kaneko-sensei. For our attendees, if you have questions, you can post them anytime in the chat box. During the Q&A, we'll try to raise all the questions as much as our time allows for the panelists to respond later. Now let's welcome our speakers. First, we have Joshua Fisher, the director of AC4 at Columbia University's Earth Institute. And as Kaneko Sensen said, uh, he recently also became a specially appointed professor here at NERVS, Hiroshima University, where he actually started collaboration with us since 2019. Uh, he does research on the nexus of environmental sustainability, natural resource governance, and social st stability in collaboration with pu public, private, um, and community-based stakeholders holders across Latin America, Sub-Saharan Africa, the Asia Pacific, and the Western United States. And our second speaker is Sophia Rhee, also from AC4 Earth Institute at Columbia University. Sophia holds a degree in environmental change and management from the University of Oxford, and also a degree in the social sciences and sustainable development from Sciences Po Paris and Columbia University. Her research activities lie in the intersection between environmental change, conflict, and development. Thank you for your time today, Josh and Sophia, and on to your presentation. Excellent. Uh, well, thank you to Hiroshima University for hosting us. Thank you to the president of Hiroshima University for creating this opportunity, to Keneko Sensei for inviting us and, and introducing us, and to Dalia Sensei for for moderating this webinar. Uh, we're really excited to speak with everyone tonight. Um, welcome to everyone around the world who's joining us. 
Uh, we're also joined, um, and later we'll hear from some other colleagues who are part of this uh, research program that we're, we're going to introduce. Um, they'll join in the, the Q&A and discussion section. But I'll start with sharing my screen. Uh, we have a brief presentation that we will share. Um, we'll try and go through it fairly quickly at a high level in order to save time for, for a question and answer later. Um, so the topic that we're exploring tonight is protected area management and governance, uh, exploring pathways for environmental sustainability and peace building. This is, as Dahlia mentioned, um, and as Keneko Sensei mentioned, a collaboration between AC4, the Advanced Consortium on Cooperation, Conflict and Complexity at the Earth Institute, um, and NERPS, the NERPS Initiative at Hiroshima University. And we're joined with two other organizations, the International Institute for Sustainable Development, which is a Canadian-based think tank, and CSEN, or the Center for International Earth Science Information Network, which is one of the leading uh, institutions doing remote sensing, managing spatial data, and providing analytical, spatial analytical services. I'll invite uh, my colleague Sophia to join in throughout the presentation, and maybe she can give a little bit of background on who we are. Hi, everybody. Thank you again for having us. Um, I'll speak a little bit about us as an institution. Uh, we are with the Environment, Peace, and Sustainability Program within the AC4 Research Unit hosted at the Earth Institute at Columbia University. We really research the linkages between environmental, social, and economic systems and how we can leverage them for social and, and environmental sustainability. We've used a variety of methods in the past, particularly with a focus on participatory methods, um, on projects ranging from land use planning to resource management, um, livelihoods, value chain analysis, et cetera. Um, sorry, could we continue to oh. the next one? Great. Um, IIS, oh, sorry, IISD is a preeminent think tank based in Canada who is also working around climate resources and economies. They do a lot of research around sustainable development um, with a focus on environment conflict and peace building. So we have some of their scholars joining us for this feature research, which we're very, very honored to have this partnership. Um, they look at fragile societies and pathways to resilience, um, focusing on climate change and security, conflict sensitive conservation, and natural resource management and peace building. Oh, thank you. Finally, we have Season. Um, they are also hosted at the Earth Institute at Columbia University, and they are a preeminent um, research unit focusing a lot on geospatial data, and they are definitely the experts in this field, hosting um, data themselves and also doing high level analyses around data infrastructures, helping decision makers, um, and really pushing research questions forward. So I would like to note that we have colleagues from each institution here to give um, more detail um, to answer any questions later on in the presentation, but we just wanted to do a quick high level overview of the organizations involved for now. Great, thank you, Sophia. And so this is our team, um, the core analytical team um, composed of myself and Sophia, and then our colleagues here from, from CSEN, Greg Yetman, Linda Pistolesi, and from IISD, Alec Crawford and Ann Hamill. And as well as Amanda Woomer, who is with uh, Habitat for Humanity and the Environmental Peacebuilding Association. She's an expert in, in monitoring, evaluation, and learning. And so together, we've got um, expertise in geospatial sciences, uh, environmental policy broadly, um, conflict sensitivity and resource management, climate resilience and policy, and monitoring and evaluation and learning. So we're a, a we think at least a pretty competent team to conduct the research we're going to discuss. And so to get into that research, we are talking about protected areas. Um, everyone has at least hopefully heard of protected areas, be they national parks or conservation areas or limited use uh, resource extraction areas. But what's so important about them, particularly at the nexus of peace and sustainability? To situate that, 
uh, we can start with uh, just a brief overview of some of the environmental dilemmas that we're facing as a globe and as individual societies. So we all know that we're in an area of, in an era of global warming, um, where some of our planetary boundaries are being pushed. We're seeing rapid decrease in biodiversity, a lot of species loss and ex extirpation. We're seeing encroachment on wild areas, and with that, um, higher incidence of disease. Um, encroachment and proximity to wild animals and natural areas as a vector for human diseases. Uh, we're all living through some of the consequences of that now. And we're seeing increased fragility and conflict in several areas that's um, either a direct product of or an indirect byproduct of some of these, some of these shifts and shocks in the system. Importantly, these are all interconnected um, through a, a, an array of complicated feedback processes such that warming increases the rate and, and um, intensity of biodiversity loss, biodiversity loss increases some of the vectors for disease, conflict increases some of our encroachment into protected areas, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So untangling these dilemmas is really, and these feedback processes is really important. Uh, particularly because each of these dilemmas on its own has a series of social, ecological, and economic costs. So the dilemmas we're facing are real, they're complicated, and they're interconnected. Fortunately, we know that there are some really effective mitigation strategies. Protected areas and, and uh, viable ecosystems provide all the services or many of the services that humans depend on, be they um, provisioning services like, um, like uh, providing genetic resources or producing oxygen and, and water or regulating services like cleaning, um, cleaning water systems, uh, buffering storm surge, et cetera. So maintaining ecosystems is really important for mitigating some of those dilemmas that we're facing. And protected areas have long been one of the cornerstone tools that policymakers and, and communities and societies have used to ensure viable, well-functioning ecosystems and the, and the continued provision of ecosystem services. So protected areas then are and long have been one of our cornerstones of, of economic or ecological sustainability, excuse me. And based on that experience and the common understanding that these are effective tools for conserving wild nature, there are increasing calls for expanding the, the network of protected areas around the world. We see that in the policy world, we see it in the nonprofit world, and in some of the civil society um, world. We're seeing these discussions play out in the 2020 agenda, looking now past to a post-2020 agenda, um, as some of these studies are showing, and in civil society initiatives like the Half Earth Project, which is a citizen science-based um, initiative that's trying to incentivize and, and encourage policymakers to conserve half of the terrestrial earth surface and half of the marine surface, precisely because these areas are critical for our continued survival. And so as we see these multiple pressures um, and dilemmas mounting, it's critically important that we start to uncover where and under what circumstances and governance regimes protected, area, protected areas can effectively contribute to our sustainability. Unfortunately, as we're seeing these increased calls, we're also seeing some evidence that um, our, ability to, our ability to conserve wild nature and wild spaces is diminishing. So over the last 30 years, we saw a real expansion and rapid growth in, in protected area designation and management. That started to taper off and we've seen some areas fall out of management, um, becoming de facto uh, open, open access zones. We've seen others um, take the next step to being degazetted, meaning they're taking their, their protected area status is taken away. And so at the same time, we're seeing an increased need for these areas. We're seeing the, the policy and political communities not as willing to engage in protected area designation and management. In addition, um, we're also seeing the things we're asking of protected areas change. So we're all familiar with nature conservation areas, national parks, and the sets of things that those were traditionally designed to do, uh, protect wild nature, safeguard genetic resources, 
contribute to citizen education, environmental awareness, uh, ensure effective environmental law and policy, et cetera. But increasingly, we're seeing um, protected areas have the additional burden of providing well-being outcomes. There's been a, a move away from fortress-style conservation to more integrated conservation, um, where these areas are expected to deliver um, economic and social dividends for the populations living in and near them. So while we're seeing the need for protected areas increase, we're seeing the, the effectiveness of them potentially, potentially diminish. Um, and it raises questions as we see this expansion of the mission, it raises questions of what protected areas are effective in delivering what services for whom. So commensurate with the need for these areas and the interest in, in advancing these areas, we've seen some trends in the research for trying to answer those questions of what areas are effective where and for whom. Um, and so this is a graph from a recent study that did a meta-analysis of um, effectiveness studies or impact studies for prote protected areas. And we see really since the 1990s exponential growth in academic and research interest in trying to understand where they're effective, what they're effective at doing, and for whom. With a lot of emphasis um, here in the last decade, um, the majority of papers are being published uh, since 2010. But we're seeing some, some interesting trends, at least. Um, these studies are not um, equal across the planet. Rather, they've been, tech, they've been historically focused on the tropics. Um, and tropical protected areas. And they've been traditionally um, focused on protected areas in developing countries, fragile countries, the global south, or really geographies outside the, the Western, um, the historical Western countries. And we also see specific countries having a really high focus for research into their effectiveness. So the data aren't even across the, across the world. Rather, there's a skew toward, um, toward developing countries in the tropics and specific countries, meaning specific types of protected areas or specific types of ecosystems. As you have seen this growth in, in effectiveness um, studies and impact assessments, um, there's been a wide ranging debate on how to assess their effectiveness, how to measure the effectiveness, how to um, continue to track the effectiveness at delivering social and environmental um, dividends. And it's been going on really 60 years as this study shows. Um, but as you'll notice in the top journals, nature, science, biological conservation, conservation biology, uh, there's a a real growth in interest um, in trying to untangle this question of how to measure protected area effectiveness. As you can imagine, it's a wide ranging debate and there's little agreement on best practices, best methods, um, best indicators. So there is a need an interest and real, real fierce debate about how to do it. And that difficulty makes sense in some ways thinking about the multiple things we're asking protected areas to do. Um, some of the difficulties um, that are associated with that are the variation in what, in what we're asking them to do, whether it's uh, protect wild biodiversity or deliver social, social impacts. Um, there's also a, a great deal of heterogeneity in the types of protected areas that exist from very strict um, nature reserves to really widely managed resource protected areas, meaning uh, timber reserves, um, non-timber forest product reserves, areas where people can come in and exploit the natural resource base. So it makes it difficult to, to decipher which protected areas deliver which types of services. In addition, uh, protected areas are highly political things. And so there's no guarantee that the areas we designate for nature conservation or um, protected areas are really the areas that we need to, to be protecting. Um, this is a map of a protected area near where I grew up in Utah called the Bears Ears National Monument. The lighter yellow boundary is the 
original border um, established by the Obama administration. The darker yellow area indicates the shrinking of that monument um, by the Trump administration as soon as they came into power. And so we see these being highly political and the extent and durability of protected areas really can be quite varied. And that brings certain measurement and uh, performance challenges. Um, specifically in the way they're managed over time, the data that's collected over time, the areas, the geographic focus or the unit of analysis over time. And importantly, these are dynamic systems. So the resource base is changing constantly. This is a protected area that I work in in Peru on the border of Peru and Brazil and Bolivia. Um, this is the area of the park, the park itself. And here's the buffer zone for the park that's meant to shield this area from human activity. And what you see here is forest loss due to illegal, largely illegal gold mining. And so these are a time series and you can see that originally 10 years ago, the much of the area was intact, but we see dramatic encroachment by human populations into the area to exploit resources. And so if we have a national park established here um, in 2010, let's say, and by 2015, the resource is completely degraded. Well, after this point, we can't really expect this area to deliver the same ecological benefits. So managing and measuring protected area effectiveness is really difficult. Um, let alone, there are multiple pathways for these protected areas to deliver the sorts of services and um, protection that we require, but most studies aren't able, aren't designed to really test for multiple causal pathways. Um, this is a, a recent study um, in science that looks at a single causal pathway. We have a protected area, we have tourists incoming, we have tourism providers. The idea is that the protected area enables local communities to increase their wealth, thereby increase their well-being and uh, incentivize their continued conservation of nature. So it's a very narrow focus on how protected areas might deliver social and environmental dividends. Um, you can imagine a plethora of other pathways, um, but studies typically aren't designed to capture that. Still, um, it is a complicated space, wide ranging debates, really difficult to measure the effectiveness of protected areas. But the good news is there is pretty broad agreement that when managed well, protected areas do actually deliver social and environmental um, benefits. That same study I was just mentioning, um, this is a graph of some of their findings showing that proximity to protected areas delivers really, really effectively on several health and, and poverty or income parameters. So just by virtue of being close to a protected area, you derive all of these social and economic benefits um, from that area. And so we're seeing a lot of evidence that individual areas deliver a host of social and economic and environmental dividends, um, but they're not measured consistently. And a caveat to that is, uh, this is another study from a, from a different colleague, um, that shows there's a high spatial overlap between exo exogenous shocks like conflict and the critical areas that we need to preserve. These are biodiversity hotspots overlaid on conflict events. We see a high spatial incident, um, meaning that these protected areas are the heart of conflict and um, the sites of conflict. Another study from some other colleagues of mine um, shows that these areas are sensitive to conflict. And so this is a study showing that um, as conflict intensity and incidents occurs, um, we see declines in, in wildlife populations. And it's pretty widespread across the African continent in this study. And it's pretty dramatic and really the effects that they were able to demonstrate are really robust. But it gets more complicated because these same authors found that different targets are sensitive in different but interconnected ways to those stochastic shocks. So while they saw conflict leads to biodiversity loss um, in terms of, of species, of, of, of animal species, they also saw that 
the, that species extirpation results in, or is at least correlated with, increases in tree cover and recuperation of natural vegetative systems. And so conflict here has this dual impact, decrease in species, increase in tree cover. And so when we're asking, is a protected area effective? We have to ask, what's it effective at doing? Um, which parameters, be they social, environmental, economic? So it's all complicated. And we're trying to untangle this, this messy system, um, bring some structure and some coherence to the data that exist, to the methods that exist, and to, to enable a framework really that can help us understand which types of protected areas are effective at doing what. And so I'll ask my colleague again, Sophia, to introduce what we're actually doing. Yeah, thank you. Um, so Dr. Fisher has really um, given us the gamut of the literature surrounded stranding protected areas. And we want to emphasize that we are situating our research within these multiple debates, given the myriad ecological and economic and conflict pressures, as well as the social criticisms that protected areas face, and the debate surrounding what effectiveness, effectiveness means, how it is achieved, and for whom. What we do recognize and underline is that protected areas are increasingly expected to deliver equitable social and environmental dividends without impeding stakeholders' ability to pursue dignified lives and without impeding national and regional economic development. So we want to really disentangle some of the literature here. And what our project is trying to do is specifically within these larger debates is answer you know, this question of how does protected area governance and management impact social and environmental sustainability? It is quite broad, but we do have some sub questions below. So breaking this um, top level question down, we're, we're asking um, what types of protected areas are most effective at delivering so environmental and social dividends? So um, Following on that, how does conflict impact protected areas' ability to deliver social and environmental dividends? Furthermore, how do governance and management impact the outcomes for various social and environmental targets across diverse stakeholders? And finally, what types of exogenous shocks impact protected areas' abilities to deliver sustainability outcomes? And so Oh, sorry. Um, so by answering these questions, some application of, you know, answering these questions would be, how do we provide guidance to protected areas and protected area managers on how to manage these areas to deliver social environmental outcomes. So that's kind of how we're orienting our research. So the research will take place in two phases, um, which will mix a quantitative and qualitative approach. Our first phase is the geospatial and econometric phase. Um, this phase attempts to take a large end study to harmonize geospatial statistical approaches previously employed in other studies. We want to expand the focus to be more inclusive of various types of protected areas and geographies. As Dr. Fisher noted earlier, there is a bias um, in non-Western countries. We also want to define and measure indicators of well being and social benefit based on recent publications as dependent variables. Um, other dependent variables include having more diverse indicators for ecosystem services and ecological integrity. So, we're really trying to expand and think of new ways to measure um, both social and environmental well being. Again, we're testing these against independent variables such as conflict, governance, and indicators for external shocks. Um, and so with this phase, we hope to move then into the, our second phase, yes, um, which will include a qualitative approach, which will really complement this large N approach. In our qualitative phase, we hope to use mixed method surveys, semi-structured interviews, and case studies. We want to select a subset of prote uh, protected areas for surveys um, using interviews, focus groups, and potentially value chain and market analysis. And the purpose of this qualitative phase is to synthesize and analyze data to identify which governance and management measures are effective at delivering social benefits to diverse stakeholders, safeguarding critical ecosystem services, enabling conflict resolution and peace building, and mitigating exogenous shocks. Again, with this framework, um, we believe that these two complementary approaches will help us to really 
um, disentangle some of the linkages that Dr. Fisher presented earlier, as well as explore what uh, governance and management tools um, practitioners, researchers, and activists, whoever is on the ground can use to really make sure that protected areas continue to be beneficial um, and equitable. Great. Thanks, Sophia. Uh, so to get that started, um, we'll give an overview of our conceptual framework that we've developed, and it's based on some recent work that we've that we're publishing um, in sustainability science as part of a special edition um, that's being edited by the Network on Environment and Research or Education and Research on Peace and Sustainability, NERPS. Um, so we'll give a broad overview of the conceptual framework and then some illustrative examples of the types of, of data that we'll be using and some of the early dilemmas. But we'll blow through this pretty quickly so that we can have a, uh, enough time for discussion and debate. So to give you a sense of how we're going to try and systematize, harmonize, and untangle some of these pathways, we can think of these systems as social ecological systems. Um, here we've got a protected area with subsurface resources, subsurface hydrology, climatological processes, stakeholders on the periphery, agriculturalists, et cetera. Um, this could be our our protected area, our natural system that provides those provisioning and regulating ecosystem services. Then we've got a series of direct or the most proximate stakeholders. Uh, we can think of these as people who exploit the resources, who use the resource base, um, but don't exploit it, don't, don't uh, damage the resource base, managers, tenants who live in and near the protected area. Each of these stakeholders are optimizing for different sets of basic needs. Um, different sets of subjective interests that they have in the area and depending on different environmental um, environmental or natural resource pathways and, and resources um, to meet their needs. And so each of these stakeholders has a different sort of impact on the protected area. We can think of their actual impact on the resource or their in orange, their impact on the governance of the, of the protected area. The protected area itself has an impact on these stakeholders, the green being the environmental quality, the resource quality, and the blue being the governance of the area. And so this is the primary set of interactions that we're, we're interested in. How do these um, users competing for different sets of, of needs, interests, and, and resource access affect the quality of the protected area? Then how does the quality of the protected area impact their ability to meet their needs. We recognize, of course, there are ex external stakeholders or second order stakeholders that have some impact on the area as well as influence over these resource, uh, over these users, but this is the primary dynamic that we're interested in. And this is a dynamic system, so they're endogenous changes, meaning there are changes in these relationships, changes in the tactics that different stakeholders are using to meet um, their needs, interests, and, and utilize the resources. Changes in this natural system and the impacts back and forth. And so these endogenous changes are one of the factors we're interested in, as well as the exogenous shocks, some of which might be climate, politics, economic shocks, et cetera. Um, the important point is that these are dynamic systems. So there's already a governance framework in place when these shocks happen or these endogenous changes happen, there are two potential pathways. Uh, utilizing the existing institutions um, to manage the incompatibilities between needs and interest satisfaction, or conflict, some sort of conflict process where the needs and interests and tactics are incompatible. So we have to create new institutions or revise old institutions, existing institutions, to resolve this conflict in order to be able to manage the resource. And so collectively, the sets of institutions, both formal, legal, administrative, and informal, cultural, um, soft power, et cetera, create the governance framework that manages the resource. And that governance framework then determines which sets of needs, interests, and resource quality issues are satisfied and for whom. And so we can think about this as individual parameters or a a multi-dimensional indicator of integrated sustainability that then circles back to have impacts through these processes, through these pathways um, on the resource and the other stakeholders. 
So this is our basic um, high level conceptual model at a sort of abstract level. We can operationalize it in terms of these being our outcome variables, um, parameters on each of these things, as well as the integrated outcome. And then independent variables, um, protected area characteristics, governance characteristics, these exogenous shocks. We can think of these being a function of these. And over time, um, these factoring back into satisfaction of these or influencing these. And so in a sort of T0, a time series, we can think of at T0, this is a function of this. At time one, these are influenced by these at T0. And so we have a, a pretty um, effective modeling architecture that we're working on um, that can start to operationalize some of this. In terms of the needs and opportunities, why this is important and why we think we're well positioned to do this, these are some of the data that we might use to, um, to measure some of the environmental aspects. Um, as I mentioned, we have a team of expert modelers and spatial statisticians and spatial scientists. So we could, we have access to multiple types of data that we can track over time using remote sensing and earth observation. So we have that capacity already in hand. Um, here are some visuals on how these are dynamic systems over time. Um, the basic approach is to identify a protected area and then measure those parameters, environmental parameters over time and in proximity to the protected area. Um, we can think about changes in, these are the, the electrification, these are nightlights um, outside of Qatar. Um, we can think about how, what that means for population centers and urbanization and electrification. Um, the point is that we have multiple ways of measuring the physical environment. And there's importantly, a solid foundation of anal analytical work on the social systems. And so these are just some studies showing um, the density of, pardon me, the density of different impact evaluations that have been conducted on protected areas um, around the world, optimizing for conservation as well as well-being targets. Um, since we're short on time, I'm gonna just skip, a, just glance over this and we can come back to it. The important thing is that the majority of the existing studies focus on only one aspect of sustainability, these well-being outcomes, and really omit a lot of the subjective um, interests that people have for protected areas. So one of the opportunities is there is a foundation of work, a foundation of data we can draw on, but importantly, one of those core pillars of sustainability that those subjective interests are really under-researched. So we think we can fill that niche. Um, importantly, there are good architectures, modeling architectures that we can draw from, um, but most of these studies um, are either single area studies and really few um, employ robust quantitative methods for uh, cross-case comparison. So we have some good models. Um, now we can build on to fill that niche. Um, and this is just sort of mapping some of the existing social parameters to our, our modeling framework. Um, these economic and health and educational uh, parameters map really well to our basic needs uh, parameter. The, these subjective parameters are really under research. That's our, our niche that we're trying to fill. Um, they've been less commonly studied, but they do fit that one of those cores, core pillars of sustainability. And importantly, a lot of the existing indicators that are used fit really well on our sort of right hand side, our uh, independent variables. So based on the work that's been done, the massive amounts of literature that have been produced and data sets, we have a good foundation and it maps to our, our, our core area of interest um, where these variables are really the mechanisms that enable environmental as well as these basic and subjective needs for different stakeholders. Uh, and then just, oh yeah, Sophia, please. Oh yeah, sorry. Just um, to briefly wrap up, we just wanted to go um, to emphasize that once we're doing done doing the large and analytical work, we will utilize experience from a, a range of other initiatives we've conducted. Um, 
So relying on tools and methods employed in other places, such as stakeholder mapping and institutional mapping, surveys and semi-structured interviews. And um, for instance, IISD in the past has published a conflict sensitive conservation and practitioners manual, which has been um, really pioneering in the field. Um, and then to wrap up, um, just some challenges um, to pose maybe back to you all. You know, we are struggling with how to best measure social and environmental dividends. That is a very, very tricky question. There's also the, the reckoning of how to reconcile spatial and temporal scales. We have to ask how to disentangle protected area impacts from other driver, drivers of social and environmental outcomes. And um, do all of the above across scalar differences. Thank you, Sophia. So that is a broad overview for our project. Um, I'll stop sharing my screen now and try and open it up to conversation uh, with you all in the audience, um, the global audience. Um, as I mentioned, we have colleagues from this research program with us who can uh, also jump in and have discussion with us and with you. Um, so we'll turn it over to Dahlia to moderate the discussion section. Thank you, Josh and Sophia, for shedding light on this um, dilemmas and drivers of social and environmental sustainability surrounding um, protected area management. Um, now, for our attendees, uh, we already received several questions, but you can uh, uh, type in your questions anytime in the chat box. And as Josh mentioned, I now um, uh, invited uh, his collaborators, uh, Greg, Linda, uh, Alec and Amanda, now they are panelists as well, so they will be available to answer your questions. So what I'm going to do is to pass to our panelists uh, two questions at a time. Um, we have received questions um, during the registration, so I will do those first. Um, we can um, yeah, raise those uh, questions first, the first, the first ones we have received. Um, so the first question is from Viliami Momoi Valu of the World Bank, and he asks, if you could explain some solutions to marine protected areas. He gave an example uh, from a small island nation in the Pacific where villages and communities decide to stop fishing in an area way, where they normally fish for a span of five years or so. But at some point they would want to be compensated for this loss or have access at least to other alternatives to protein diet sources. And somewhat related to this question is a comment from Su Miet Mon here at Hiroshima University. She is interested in how to deal with the encroachment problem in the protected area management system where local people can cause a forest land conversion and their limited livelihood options create high dependency on natural uh, forest resources. So let's have Excellent. those questions first. Excellent, both really important questions um, and not easy questions to answer, but I'll invite my colleague Alec Crawford to, to jump in since you've heard so much from me. Alec has done a lot of work um, in fisheries and in forest ecosystems at, that ask some of these questions. Um, and then I can also augment with some work on MPAs that I've done. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, hello from nighttime in Toronto. Thanks so much for, uh, for letting us join. On MPAs in particular, uh, I haven't done too much work with marine protected areas themselves, but I think that hopefully, we're hoping that um, some of the lessons that come out of this for terrestrial ecosystems will be equally applicable to marine protected areas. I know that some of the issues are, of course, going to be uh, different, but we're not, uh, I don't think, going to try to restrict our analysis to, um, to terrestrial protected areas in, in such a way that, you know, some of the lessons that we learn can't be applied more broadly. In the past uh, at ISD, we've done um, quite a bit of work on conflict sensitive conservation which is uh, certainly in line with this project and hopefully this project will lead to a, um, a renewed or revised approach to that, uh, that style of project and program management when it comes to conservation. And the essential idea is, you know, as Josh has outlined, how do we figure out what the best 
the best types of conservation internet uh, interventions are uh, for delivering on uh, enhancing peace building opportunities or creating peace building opportunities and of course um, avoiding the exacerbation of conflict risks so typically in the, in the work that we've done in the past on this um, that approach was designed in such a way that it could be equally applicable to terrestrial and marine spaces uh, and I think that we're hoping with this research that that the same will be true um, I'll maybe I'll, I'll pass it back to you, Josh, if you have anything to add to that. Excellent. Yeah, thank you, Alec. Um, yeah, and both the MPA and the encroachment question, one of the things that comes to mind is the need to really understand the entire institutional architecture, both the formal, the legal um, institutions, as well as the informal institutions. Um, in a lot of protected areas that I've worked in, we have, we being the stakeholders, including sort of external uh, support agents and the managers themselves and the community stakeholders tend to focus on a very narrow set of institutions um, and have those dominate the ways in which we resolve some of these conflicts around uh, the trade-offs that communities face for any management decision. But when we expand the, the institutional analysis to look at other types of institutions that can be uh, leverage to augment, um, maybe it's payment for ecosystem services, maybe it's um, uh, uh, benefit sharing from related projects. Um, then we can sort of expand the decision-making space and the negotiation space. Um, it's difficult to do because you have to have a lot of knowledge of a lot of institutions or at least stakeholders with that institutional awareness, um, but it's worth it. Um, so something like in the case of um, MPAs in Mozambique, trying to understand what the um, what the smallholder agriculturalists' um, interests were in the MPAs and the onshore um, resources um, near the MPAs, uh, enables you to understand what some of the other value chains that are associated with these areas are. And when you can start to make linkages across multiple value chains that on the face of them aren't necessarily connected to the MPA strictly, then you have some opportunities for expanding that, that decision-making space. Um, and uh, several groups have done a lot of work on MPAs. I'd be happy to, if you want to post your, your, um, your email privately to the moderator, I can send some, some work from the vast literature on evaluating the effectiveness of MPAs. Um, and connect you with colleagues also. The same for the encroachment question, sorry. Right, yes. Thank you, Josh and Alec. Now we have uh, another two questions. This one is from Gerardo Vigne Vizcaino, and I quote here, how to balance the conservation targets of a PA, that is the traditional untouchable concept set by the planners, with the local community's social needs, especially in countries and regions with a serious conflicts such as drug production, war, population displacement, and incremental poverty. So this is the first one. The second one is from our friend Colin Hendricks. Um, and he said that this is a fascinating project and some of the literature presented uh, suggests uh, evaluating the benefits of protected areas will, will require comparing things that are not easily commensurable. Some things are easy to quantify in dollars, for example, such as tourism, some are not. And I'm curious, he's curious how uh, you anticipate communicating this trade-offs and net benefits. And he said, again, fascinating project. Excellent. Well, Cullen, uh, thank you for attending, and it's great to be connected virtually again. Um, as for the first question, it's really, really important. Um, and perhaps I'll invite Amanda Woomer to, to join in on this conversation. She has been part of various initiatives looking at, um, looking at environmental peace building. So she might have a, a good answer for, for us. Thanks, Josh. I, I got a little lost in those two questions since they were a bit long. Um, could you summarize the first one again for me? Uh, the first one is um, balancing the targets of the PA with the local community's social needs. Mm -hmm. um, and the second one is um, 
how do you anticipate uh, the trade-offs and net benefits um, in this research uh, with quantifying them? Okay, so, so maybe Josh, we'll have I... you take the first, and yeah. then um, Greg and Linda can take the second. Great. Um, so for the first, I, I've had experience with a number of different kinds of conservation projects, including protected areas. And I think that question is why we really wanted to do a mixed methods approach to this project. Um, because without the second phase, which Sophia described uh, with the more qualitative aspects of interviews and surveys, we would be missing out on some of those things that are difficult to the to the point of the second question to quantify. Um, and it's not always easy to get large and survey data on those issues of how communities are affected and what benefits they perceive and um, how they're subjectively feeling about their situation near a protected area. You know, we might have numbers that indicate better employment or um, economic growth, but we really haven't been able to, in a lot of cases um, with that kind of data, get to the um, felt needs of the community. So while we're all under um, operating under COVID restrictions and we'll have to to have some creative solutions to this, we are hoping that by incorporating that second phase, we'll dig more into those kinds of questions. Um, and hopefully this will spur on additional work that could focus on specific areas. But as Josh mentioned earlier, you know, um, ISD has the conflict sensitive conservation manual, which digs into some of these more subjective community needs and there are others as well. Um, but hopefully we can contribute to that, to that discussion. Just to augment that, the drivers of direct violence, um, the connection between direct violence and natural resources is really complicated. And Cullen um, perhaps um, can speak to that better than most of us. Um, but the these are never rarely direct or rarely remain direct for very long. Um, and so for us, the importance of a project like this is identifying some major patterns in the data um, as to what those connections and some of the driving influences might be, and then really diving deeply to fill in the, the nuance and the depth, the granular detail of underlying those patterns. Um, but perhaps um, Greg and Linda can talk about the difficulties measuring some of these either social or the environmental um, factors. They've worked extensively on some of these issues and how we can select viable proxies for some of these larger phenomena. Hi, yeah, Greg here. Uh, Linda, unless you had something you wanted to jump in with right away, I can have a start. Um, so, thanks. Um, so, you know, the biophysical parameters are the ones that are, of course, easier to measure on a regular consistent basis. Um, remote sensing data will help us with changes in land cover and vegetation pattern over whatever time period we, we end up focusing on. We've discussed it, but I don't think we've settled on a, a, fun, a final time window yet. So that helps a lot with changes that can be seen from remote sensing data and, and even surveys on the ground that are um, related to species richness and, and modeled uh, information related to that. It's much more difficult for the socioeconomic parameters, of course. We have some good data on population, um, census-based, but more relevant is probably the model population surfaces that we've done a lot of work with that are related to, again, things that can be measured like um, uh, lights at night and built-up areas that are expanding from optical and radar-based data. You can get a good idea for how growth uh, in urban or even small settlements uh, is occurring either within or, or adjacent to the protected areas and then quantify that. And more difficult is to measure the impact of that, of that type of growth, uh, those types of um, conversional land cover. You know, you can quantify the, the area, but, but the direct ecosystem impacts again are more difficult. But um, some of the proxies we would use on the survey side for population well-being would be things like the demographic health surveys and multiple indi indicator community surveys augmented by surveys we'd perform to look at the well-being of the communities from 
locally relevant factors. So, you know, I'm not sure how many people are familiar with these surveys, but a lot of them will use wealth and poverty indicators that are that are locally relevant, uh, like uh, different structure types or uh, ownership of different modes of transportation from bicycle through to car, whatever's most appropriate, um, things like that to, to get at those. So it's, it's going to be a, um, a data exercise to, to carefully choose the data. So don't get overwhelmed with the amount of data, but, uh, but I think it's, it's a fairly rich, uh, set of data sets that we can select from and then integrate with the study. And just building on that, you know, there are limitations to what we can do at a large end scale, um, some data based and then some um, interpreting what the data actually means. So something like the slide I showed earlier on on nighttime lights, what do what does nighttime light actually represent? Well, it represents many things It potentially indicates higher socioeconomic um, latitude, it potentially indicates higher levels of of urbanization, it potentially um, indicates a series of things that could encroach on a protected area, but it also could indicate things that could relieve some pressure from the protected area because the impact is being concentrated in the periphery rather than um, being dispersed across a wider geographic area. So there are some challenges that we need to grapple with, um, which is why we're taking this, this approach of sort of a large end pattern recognition process and then diving deeply to see um, what underlies the patterns and what sorts of governance, importantly, what sorts of governance and institutional architecture enables um, better delivery on the multiple sets of targets. Does Linda want to add something to that? Um, I, I don't really have anything to add. I do want to say thank you very much for the opportunity um, to be here and, and listen in, um, but I, I don't have anything to add to what Greg said. Okay, thank you, Linda. Um, thank you. Um, we actually receive a lot of uh, good, very good questions, and unfortunately, we don't have enough time to raise all of them, but we had questions from Professor Akira Hibiki of uh, Tohoku University, um, Juan Diego is a Padilla, Russell Kabir, and um, someone um, anonymous attendee, and uh, Shinji Mochizuki of Hiroshima University. What we're going to do is to uh, forward these questions to the panelists, and uh, the panelists can, um, can uh, answer these questions via email maybe later on. And I really wish we could continue discussing the many issues and you know prospects surrounding environmental peace building. But I'm afraid that we now have to conclude this web webinar. Thank you, Josh, Sophia, Alec, Amanda, Greg, and Linda for joining us today and sharing your research project with us. Thank you to our attendees for joining us today from different time zones. This webinar series will lead to the first NERPS International Conference, as Professor Kaneko mentioned a while ago. And I hope to see you again in our upcoming webinars. The next one will be on February 12, and we'll be having Dr. Florian Krampa of CIPRI, and he will be talking to us about peace and sustainability in the Anthropocene. Please visit our website, www.nerps.org, and you can also find us in major social media platforms where we share our announcements and events and many opportunities for collaboration. Thank you everyone for your time and participation. Stay safe and healthy and until the next one. Bye for now. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you Thanks very much. Thanks, bye. And thank you to my colleagues for joining in. And again to NERPS, thank you so much. <laughs>